This is Lunch for the Soup, uh, November of 2018. We are here to talk about a lot of different things. We've had a great year so far. We passed a big uh, tax renewal which will build many, many new schools. Uh, but today in particular I'm going to talk about the accountability system. Our scores came out and we're on the uh, incline. We're growing and that's what we want to do. This year for the first time the accountability plan in the state has, has a progress or a growth index in it. And so all of our schools are growing. Uh, the major uh, areas where our scores have been have grown. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do. I'm not going to say that we don't. We have a lot of work to do, but we're moving in the right direction. Probably the most important thing we can do in this community is support our kids. Our parents have to be the first and best teacher our children ever have. And so I encourage our parents out there to make sure you take care of our children. You make sure you pr provide a place for them to study at night, to sit down, have some quiet time, Help them with their homework if they're younger children, but pay attention to them in their schoolwork and let them know that it's important to you as a parent. That's probably the most important thing we can do. Uh, early childhood, there's nothing more important. So early childhood, if you have little children at home that aren't even in school yet, work with them, read books to them. Uh, make them in inquisitive about things, thinking about things. Give them opportunities that they may not have otherwise. So. Parents are the first and best children our students ever have. We need them to be a big part of our system. I'm going to talk about a few things today. Mainly, I'm going to talk about district and school performance scores, but I want to start with just a few things that we've achieved over the years besides the teacher uh, pay increase. Uh, we've grown academically. I'm, I'm going to get back to that in just a few minutes. Okay, thank you. We've grown academically. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Uh, We've opened a new school in Broadmoor Elementary School. Absolutely beautiful. If you haven't been in that school, you need to go by there and just stop and, and go in and say, I want a tour. They'll give you a tour of the school. It's beautiful. Brad's here. I see Brad shaking his head back there. Had a lot to do with that school. Uh, we are, now this is the uh, phase, for, excuse me, phase three of the tax plan. Broadmoor Elementary came online this year. Park Elementary is under construction. It will open in August. It will be the first elementary 21st century design school. When I've mentioned 21st uh, century, you look at Lehigh, the, the format that it is. It's like that in elementary, so we're going to see how that works. One of the things we've done with that school, though, is we've partnered it with the highest performing elementary school we have, which is WAM, West Hill Heights Academic Magnet. So those two schools. Park Elementary and West Hill Heights will partner in Discovery Education. They will have uh, professional development together, the teachers, the students will intermingle together. That's going to be a really exciting opportunity for those uh, teachers and kids in both schools. And then Jefferson Home Sites, which is the last school of the Phase 3, is in design and that goes out for bid in February. And that school will be built on 20 acres right behind Blue Cross. It is going to be a 21st century design K-8. In fact, last night we had the last meeting for the naming of it. The naming committee sent me three names this morning, which I sent to the board, forwarded to the board and said, these are the three names that the committee has suggested in no particular order. You pick the name of the school. And I think some of the, one of the names is Jefferson Terrace Academy, one is Jefferson Terrace Academy of Excellence, and one is can't remember. Community school? Jefferson, Jefferson Terrace Community School. That's it. Those are the three names. They'll pick one of those three for the new school. And that will be a K-8 school. So that's the first K-8 we've built in a while. Uh, <coughs> one of the things I think you'll be happy to hear is that we, we're beginning to look at organizational and operational efficiencies. We have to become more efficient as a school district. We have hired a consultant, Lean Frog, at a very low price to come in here and over the next three or four months evaluate our organizational and operational efficiency. And so at the end of, let's say, April, March or April, they're going to give us a recommendation on what we can do if we'd like to do it to become more efficient. At the same time, staff and I are working on budget for next year. And we're talking about our goal this year is to cut between 30 and 40 million dollars. Now that's a lot of money to cut out of a budget. And, and so you may say, how will we do that? Well, one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to put more emphasis on site-based management. 
the principals in the schools will probably reduce their budget a little bit and give them autonomy to pick the staffing they need. However, if they save a certain amount of money, there may be incentives that could be linked to that, where they could get money back if they have an, if they if we incentivize them. So there's a lot of different ideas floating out there. The new board and, and I will have a retreat in January to talk more about that. But we're excited to talk about uh, becoming more efficient, and we need to do that. So let me talk about, let's talk about district and school performance scores right now. And the first slide is, a, is the old formula. Now, there's a lot of changes going on. It's hard, it's hard to, to, evaluate, to compare one year to another because, because the, the rules change. This year, in particular, they changed greatly. If you think about in the past, school systems have gone to, are trying to achieve basic, and now that is mastery. So now these, these, what we're trying to achieve is growth to mastery. So think about it like this. The old system was mainly on assessment. Look at elementary, 100% assessment. That's just that test they took in that week. 95% uh, assessment in middle schools, and then high school had four, ACT, graduation rate. That graduation rate is how many students who started in the ninth grade graduated in the, in the twelfth grade with eight semesters or four years. If they took longer than that, they're not in the grad rate. So if you see 100% graduation rate in the school, that means every student who started there in the ninth grade graduated in four years. If 80%, then 20% of those didn't graduate in that four-year period. So that's grad rate. And then the graduation index is the strength of diploma. I think I'm right there. And that is what kind of advanced placement courses did you take? Dual, en and dual enrollment courses did you take? CLEP, which is a college level efficiency program so to see if you're on level. And uh, also Jumpstart. So those are the kind of things if a, a student can just go through school without that, but if they take those courses, you get more points for accountability. And that's, so this is the old formula. Okay, so let's take a look at the way we performed on the old formula. Now, the state this year decided to give two scores. They decided to give us a score on what it would be in the old formula. So you could have some comparison. So districts and superintendents and families and, and parents could say, if we were on the old formula, what would we have done? And so that's what this is right here. So if you take a look at 1617, EBR was a 73.5, we grew to an 80.8. .8. That's a significant growth. If you look over here on the right, that's 7.3 points of growth, which now the new formula includes a growth, a growth formula, which the old one did not. The state grew 6.2, we grew 7.3, uh, we're still a C. So that sh this, would, this is all on the old formula here. So now we take a look at the new formula. What does the new formula look like? So if you'll take a look at elementary schools, before it was 100% assessment. This year it's 75% assessment, but 25% of on progress or growth. And if you think about it like this, you know, we're not where we need to be by any stretch of, of the imagination. We all know that. But we're moving in the right direction pretty significantly. In fact, we were the top in the top six of, of districts, of 70 districts this year, we were in sixth place in growth. That's pretty good. So we're moving in the right direction. So if you look at that, based on the new formula, 25% is growth, 75% is performance on a test, if you go to middle schools, you have 70% on assessment, the test, 25% on growth, but then there's 5% on the credit accumulation. That's called DCAI, District Credit Accumulation Index. What is that? That's bringing the rigor down to middle schools. That's bringing the high school courses down to middle schools. Algebra 1, all of those ninth grade courses you think about in English, math, social studies, and, and, and uh, science, bring those classes down to the eighth grade, and there's even some seventh grade students doing that as well. When you do that, they get credits for high school graduation. It takes 24 gra credits to graduate. 
So they've accumulated credit in the middle school. And so that's what that 5% is right there. And then when you go to high school, it's even more confusing, okay? <laughs> it used to be four pieces, now yeah. it's what? One, two, three, four, five pieces. So what they've done basically is you still have ACT, which is 25%. You still have the strength of diploma, which is 25%, and that is what AP courses do you have? What dual enrollment courses do you have? That's the strength of diploma. You still have the graduation rate, those who graduate in four years, but now the assessment piece, which used to all be EOC, which was end of course testing. At the end of the courses, you take a test, EOC. 25% used to be EOC, but now they've cut that in half, and 25% is EOC, and 25% is uh, progress, is the progress piece. So 12.5% is the progress, those students who, who uh, have progressed. So let's take a look at where we are. Now, this, this one is going to show you the transition in value. And this shows you how the state has given us a roadmap to where we need to be for 2025. And what they're saying is, by 2025, we need to be at A in everything. Now, looking at the history, we know they're going to move that bar up, right? It's going to keep moving up. So we can't say, all right, in 2025, we're going to, I mean, we're already in A in one of the indexes. EBR is already in A in one of the indexes, DCAI. So we, we can't just rest on our laurels and say we're done. As, as we get better, every district I'm talking about, they're going to raise the bar. It's confusing. So right now, if you look at 1718, that's the scoring rubric for 1718. But next year, not next year, but starting in 2023 or 2022 to 2024, it's going to be a little bit higher. So A goes from a 90 to a 95, and 24 and beyond, it goes to 100 points. So you can see how the scoring rubric gets more difficult. So you can see it, and, and you can sort of follow along there and see how it gets more uh, aggressive each year. So that's the state's rubric on how we progress and how we get better. All right, let's take a look at K-8. Now this is all under the new formula. And you know, speaking of the new formula, I'm going to mention this right now. You probably read in the newspaper, with the new formula, which is more rigorous, more difficult, you're going to have schools that drop in letter grade because the new formula changed. Well, the good news is we stayed a C. That's the good news on the new formula. But we did have some schools that went from A's to B's or B's to C's or even D's to F's. And every district had that. You know, when you look at the Baton Rouge area in particular, <coughs> Central and West Feliciana went from an A district to a B district. That's pretty tough. So this year, had we stayed on the old formula, in the state there would be 21 A districts in the state of Louisiana, about a third of the districts, a little less than a third, about 30%. If we'd have stayed on the old formula, we would have 21 A districts. Under the new formula, we have four. So we're a C at 65.4. If you take a look at the, the uh, indices that indicate how we get where we are, if you look at the left-hand side, in student performance, K-8, we're a D. That's not good. Not good enough. You could, but that's where we are. And that's about 35% of your uh, results. If you look at the growth, though, we're a B. And that's good. I mean, we had, we had about 90% of our schools that grew at a significant level, I think either A, B, or C level. And 70% of our schools grew at an A or B level. That's significant. And so we're moving in the right direction, and that's what we're talking about. But K-8 growth was a B. And then you look at the dropout credit accumulation, we were an A. And so that means our eighth graders in our schools are taking every, every middle school we have right now is offering high school credit courses. Every middle school. And that's a result of that. I was, when I worked for the State Department, I was in a high school out west, in western part of Louisiana. I'm not going to name it. It was a very good school. 
they have zero AP classes in the high school. And that has to change. Those kind of things have to change. And so in our middle schools, every middle school offers high school credits and we're giving them to them and when they pass them, they get that credit accumulation, which is now an A. So that shows you the indices from K-8. Let's take a look at high school. And I'm gonna be honest with you, high school is where we struggle. It's, it's tough, high schools are tough. So there's five different indices for high school under the new formula. If you take a look, starting from the left, the assessment, which is 6% of the score, is a D. So on those EOCs, those end of course tests, we're at a D level right now, not good enough, not acceptable, we've gotta do better. On the growth index, we're at a B. And so we're moving in the right direction, but we're not there yet. So we're a B in growth, and that's 6%. When you look at ACT, we're D. And we're working on ACT every day to get better in that. There's a lot of different things you can do for that. There's a lot of theories on what you need to do, but our ACT has got to get better. You know, colleges and universities are raising it. LSU's changing their philosophy on that a little bit but the standards are raising. And I want to talk about ACT for a moment. 18 is generally considered by the company that makes ACT, the test, 18 is generally considered to be the minimum score for college readiness. That's generally accepted around the nation. If you score an 18, that is the minimum you should score to be college ready. So before this year, in the old formula, an 18 scored you 100 points on the accountability. This year, it's moved to 21. So our kids will get no points. I think I'm right on that. They'll get, they'll get fewer points if they score an 18. So that shows you the rigor of the entire test. So they get fewer points if they, if they score 18, but if they score a 21, they'll get 100 points on the ACT. So that shows you how each one of these indices is changing. So Warren, yes. I, I hate to interrupt you, but how does work keys fit in? Because finally they're recognizing work keys. Now how does that fit into that score? Work but keys. Talk just about ACT. <laughs> work keys is a test produced by ACT, which is in three parts, which gives the career readiness. It's more for those kids who are in Jumpstart, who take. Uh, those courses to be in careers rather than going to college, although they could go right there to Baton Rouge Community College, Dr. Stive, right? Our, our chancellor, Dr. Stive. So they would take work keys and there's a formula that equates to points. Okay, so there's a complex. I've always thought yeah. work keys needed to be. I, I agree. We, we think work keys ought to be equal a, to ACT. It's a complicated formula, and that's why you haven't. But there is a way to translate it into. Yes. Based on your score and work keys, it'll translate to certain points on ACT. Does that make gotcha. sense? Yes. That's right. I believe work keys ought to count the same because if, if the state says after your 10th grade year, right? The state says at the end of your 10th grade year, you should choose a pathway. That's what all this jumpstart is, pathways. You can go to pathways of welding or medical or whatever. And so I think those kids' work keys ought to count the same as ACT, but it doesn't. There's a formula. There's all kind of hurdles we have to do here, right? <laughs> so we're just, we're just hurtling around the track all the time. So uh, yeah, work keys will translate into points, so for ACT. All right, and if you look at cohort graduate, graduation index, we're not as good as we should be there. I, I'm, I'm quite frankly very disappointed that we're not higher in graduation rate. That's tough though. It, high school is tough on kids, it really is. We're, we're to see, but we're growing. That's the main thing you need to know. When you look over there at the growth index, we're getting better, so I expect these to get better. Then when you look at the strength of diploma, whether they have the college level efficiency program, the AP, dual enrollment, or jumpstart, that, that's the strength of diploma which gives them, uh, and we're, doing, we're a B in that which is good. All right, let's take a look at, this, this slide here is just gonna give you where our schools are. And I think it's good that 70% of our schools 
are progressing at a B or higher, and 95% of our schools are progressing at a C or better, but there's 5% who aren't progressing. And we're gonna take a look at those schools, and we're gonna say, what's the issue here? How can we help you get better? Because if you're not progressing, that's a problem. Because when a teacher takes a student at the beginning of the year, and you end the year up, and that student took the same test and did worse on it, or the same, I need to go look in the mirror, right? We've, we've got to, if we're a good teacher, we've got to progress our students. And, and see, that's the thing with accountability. You know, poverty is the, is the great thing that, that keeps a lot of our kids where they are sometimes. And that sometimes they don't come to us ready in kindergarten, we know that. And poverty, those kids don't have the experiences. And kids learn through experiences. But if you can take a child where they are and you can grow them each year, you're a successful teacher because that's what your job is, to grow those students. So if one school has a student starting here and one school has a student starting here and they grow the same, this student isn't gonna catch up with this one. There's an old saying, if you have a great teacher, you can uh, progress them two years in one year. Two years in one year. If you have a bad teacher, they'll go back at least a year. So the quality of teacher is really what we've been focused on this year. Dr. Tamal here with uh, our curriculum and instruction team. Uh, the ESSA grant has given us an opportunity, and I want you to think about this a minute, to do several things. First and foremost, we purchased all Tier 1 materials. What are Tier 1 materials? Those are materials that the State Department says are the highest quality instructional materials. We, per we did not have all Tier 1. So if you're, if you're training kids for the last three years on materials that are not Tier 1, they're, they're not going to be taught some of the things that they have to learn for this test. Now, this is the very first year that all of our kids are working on Tier 1 materials. So there's an expectation that we're going to get better. And I, I think we all have that expectation. That's key. That was about a million dollars from the ESSA grant where we, where we were able to purchase Tier 1 materials. The second thing is professional development. I've been in this business long enough to know that the rubber meets the road in the classroom, right? I'm not really important in the big scheme here. It's the teacher in the classroom. It really is. You put a great teacher in the classroom, they're going to get, those kids are going to succeed, right? And so we have to train our teachers to be better teachers. Now, we have awesome teachers, but we have to have a continuous improvement. That's the key word here. In ESSA, in our school system, in every school system, is continuous improvement. And so we're training our teachers at a rate like we've never trained them before. We've purchased about 35,000 Chromebooks in the last two and a half years. Students are working from grades four. I think it's five now. Is it four? I think it's four. So grade three through 12 now have, have Chromebooks. About 35,000 devices have been purchased. So they're used, if you go in the classroom now, they're working on computers. Because right now, grade five through 12 or five through 11, they're working, they're testing on computers. So they have to be able to know what they're doing. So you can see sort of where we are. So taking a look at, taking a look at our, our district for an example, 20 of our schools are top gain schools. That's about a fourth of our schools, a little less than a fourth of our schools. That means they demonstrated excellence in student progress from one year to the next. And then there's a new label on schools this year, and that is equity honoree. Those are schools that have demonstrated excellence educating students with disabilities, disabilities, English language learners, or economically disadvantaged students. And so we have uh, 13 of our schools are, uh, are equity honorees. Go, you can go back, that's all right. And wait, go back one. Yeah, let's try. So we're number one tied for equity honoree in the state with 13. Okay, you can go ahead. And you can see our top gain schools. Some of them will sort of jump out at you too, like Claiborne Elementary. If you look at Claiborne Elementary, Crestworth, South Downs, 
What, what one do you mean? Capital. Capital. Yep, capital. So those are our top gain schools, and you can see our equity honor raise this year. And there were some that earned both labels. <coughs> All right. And so uh, I'll open it up for questions, and then I'll give it to somebody else to answer. Right. <laughs> So I think we've had a good year academically. Uh, when you're, one of the things I didn't mention is this. In the last, since 2013, five years, you know, we've talked about AP, advanced placement. We talk about AP. In the last five years, our African-American students have grown 742% in scoring three or above on the advanced placement test. Now, now, let me think about that a little bit. The AP test, advanced placement is a different curriculum. It takes a teacher who's certified in advanced placement. It's a different curriculum. When they finish the course, they get a score in the course. They can pass the course, and then they take the test. And there's five different levels of the test. If you score a three or above, three or above, you get college credit. That saves parents money, lots of money. We have a lot of students who go into college as sophomores from this district. So over the last five years, the number of African-American students who've scored three or above is up 742%. That's number one in the state. That's, that's something to say, we're doing something the right way, we're getting better closing the achievement gap. So I'm gonna stop right there and see if there's any questions you may have. We just opened a brand new school, Broadmoor Elementary. We're in, in construction with Park Elementary and that will open in August. And we're in design with uh, Jefferson Home Sites. And it will be a new school starting in 2020. So we have new schools on the market coming in. We also are planning some consolidation of schools, which I think is gonna be really important. Uh, we, we also are gonna work on our budget to reduce our budget by up to $30 million this year. I think we have to become a more efficient organization. We've hired a consultant to come in at a very low price to help us uh, do some efficiencies organizationally and operationally. So I think those kind of things are really going to help us moving forward. But when today's program is over, what would you like people to keep in mind about the progress that is being made in East Baton Rouge schools? I, I think that they need to know we're a great school system moving forward and getting better. We're not where we want to be, but we're moving forward. Most people don't realize we have 12 national blue ribbon schools. We had 11 students score perfect 36s on the ACT last year. We had two national uh, scholars. There are only three from each state. We had two of them at Baton Rouge High School. We have some fantastic opportunities in magnet schools. Uh, we have uh, fantastic opportunities in robotics and STEM. So they need to take a look at us. If they haven't taken a look at EBR schools lately, they need to take a look at EBR schools. If people have questions like more information, what should they do? Well, go to our website, uh, ebrschools.org, or call us at 922-5400.